Good morning. How is everybody? Thank you. Thank you. Keith's looking 15 years younger today. He looks like he feels it, too. <laughs> oh. Ooh, it's almost football season, so he's like dogging on you already. Hey, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Let's stand, let's pray, and let's worship. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for the opportunity to gather. And God, thank you for all these wonderful people that you've brought together. God, I pray that you be with us this morning as we give you the praise that you deserve. God, I pray that we sing a wonderful, wonderful song to you this morning. God, you deserve it all. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this morning. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Sing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Be seated if you say, Good morning, Pastor Keith. Good morning, Pastor Keith. 
<laughs> Some of you didn't get the right inflection in there. It's good morning, Pastor Keith. <laughs> uh, grab your bulletins if you would this morning. A couple things I'd like to make mention of. Uh, first of all, you will notice in there in your bulletin, if you are a guest with us this morning, we want to say welcome. We're glad that you're here worshiping with us. You'll find in there, I am muted. You are muted. I... I'm not muted up here. Okay. I can talk louder, and then the, the people at home on the internet will just have to pretend they can understand what I'm saying. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, if, you would, if you would grab your bulletins. I'm sorry. I'm going to start over. Good morning, Pastor. No. <laughs> There's a connection card in your bulletin. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that, filling that out, you can either drop it in the offering plate as it goes by, or you can uh, take it to our t kitchen area, trade it with a kitchen worker. They're going to send you home uh, with a gift just for being our guest this morning. You'll notice uh, there's also in your bulletin there is a deacon ministry um, duties uh, sheet in there. Uh, we, I told you over the next couple of months, we're going to be uh, going through the process of selecting a few more deacons. So if you would like to take a look at what those duties are, uh, that's, that's information for you, and you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. If you look inside in the, the colorful middle page, there's a couple things I'd like to make mention of. Uh, number one, our outdoor service. <clears throat> I told you a couple weeks ago that it was going to be on August 6th. I lied. It's going to be on August 13th, okay? So we're, going to, we're, we're moving that to August 13th. So our outdoor service, uh, we're going to have one service outside. I believe we talked about doing it at, at 930 um, so we'll have one service and then we'll have a kind of an early lunch together. We'll have some fun together um, and, and, and just and be out in God's creation. Uh, that's going to be on the 13th. August 6th is going to be our youth-led Sunday. Okay, so uh, you, guys, you guys enjoy youth-led Sundays, right? Uh, yeah. Gets, always gets a little raucous, a little crazy, but we'll, uh, we turn the service over to the, to the teenagers and let them lead us in worship and, and preach for us and do all the, all the behind-the-scenes stuff and everything. Uh, so that's always a lot of fun. That's going to be on August 6th. Also wanted to draw your attention to Sunday, July 30th, which is next Sunday. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Vance Johnson, is going to be here, a former uh, Denver Bronco. He's going to be here in the evening. That's going to be at 6.30 p.m. Um, he's going to be here to share his testimony with us and how Celebrate Recovery has really made a difference in his life. It's, it's not just for Celebrate Recovery folks. It's for anybody who would like to come. So we would encourage you to, to invite your friends to come see. He's got a powerful testimony testimony he's going to share with us on the 30th. And then also this afternoon, um, if you are interested at all in our American Heritage Girls uh, program, uh, and uh, is it just for, no, it's also for Trail Life as well. Um, there's going to be an ice cream social uh, this afternoon at 3.30 uh, um, where you can come and get information about whether you would, whether you have a child you would like to incorporate or include into that, or if you would like to help volunteer uh, in that ministry as well. You come today, this, you come back this afternoon at 3.30. All right, I believe that's it. Let's everybody stand. Let's cross an aisle. Let's shake somebody's hand. Let them know you're glad to see them this morning.
daughters of the Son of Man Stories of a Savior Holiness with human hands Treasure for the traitor No ear has heard, no eye has seen The image of the Father Until heaven came to live with me A rescue like no other You are worthy You are worthy of your name You are worthy You are worthy of your name Jesus you did not speak, you made no sound You died for your accusers And as your blood fell to the ground Redefined my future. Yet on the day that you arose, the darkness ran for cover. For the King of Kings has claimed his throne. Now until My ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the battle, my anchor for all my days. And you stand by my side, and you stood in my place. Jesus, no other name. Only Jesus, no other name. Yo 
may be seated. Actually, remain standing. Remain standing, if you would, and turn with me to Acts chapter 8. I figure it's easier to stay standing than it is to sit down and stand right back up, right? I don't do the up and down so much anymore. We're going to read our scripture this morning, first thing. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 25. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 25. And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he arose and went. And behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. And when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, well, how could I, how could I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture, which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and began, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water! What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to the cities until he came to Caesarea. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're here this morning, as we see what can only be described as a divine appointment, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see ourselves in this story. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see that you have you have a plan for each and every one of us. You have divine appointments set for us as well to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, may we be willing, may we be, may we be prepared, may we be used by you in such a way. In your name I pray, amen. Now you may be seated. What we see here, you know, have you guys ever heard of a divine appointment? I can't, I can't think of a more obvious example of a divine appointment. The idea of a divine appointment is that God has something set for you, a, 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 uh, a time for you to be in the right place at the right time to give the message to the right person, right? That's a divine appointment. Now, I've experienced those kinds of things. If you've been a Christian for a while, if you've been willing to share the gospel, you've probably experienced something like that where you're like, oh, maybe you don't even realize it, but until later on, you're like, oh, that's why that happened. That's why I was there. I wouldn't have been there normally, but that's why God put me there. And so it was so that I could share with that person. I remember I, I, whenever I fly, I try to, I, I, I ask God, okay, God, put me next to somebody I can share with. Put me next to somebody I can witness to. And, and one time I got on the plane and I was, you know, I was sitting in, in the, the aisle seat, which I hate the aisle seat. If you're, if you're a wide guy like me, you hate the aisle, aisle seat. Do you know why? Does anybody know why wide guys don't like the aisle seat? The cart. The cart goes by and slams into my elbow or shoulder because, I, I mean, I can't, I can't, you know, I, I end up doing this whenever the card is coming by because I'm just like, please don't do it, right? It's not funny when you hit your funny bone, right? <laughs> so anyway, I was sitting on the aisle seat, but I was kind of leaning over this way because the cart was coming by and I looked over and the guy next to me opened up a Bible. And I thought, oh, okay, he's, he must be a Christian or something. So I, so I asked him, I said, hey, uh, you know, 
I'm a Christian too. What flavor are you? <laughs> right? I wanted to know what kind of then I, he said, Oh, well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. And I said, Oh. <laughs> kind of looked up like, okay, God. <laughs> right. And we got to talking about whether and I played dumb a little bit. Hey, what are the differences? And what do you believe versus what we believe? And you know, and then we got stuck on they don't believe there's a hell and all this other stuff, and we started talking about that. I, you know, I believe that God answered my prayer and put me next to somebody that I could share with. Right, And so, so I believe in divine appointments. This is probably the most obvious example of a divine appointment. As a matter of fact, it's so divine that God handled all the travel to and from, right? <laughs> I mean, think about that for a moment. Look at how it starts. It says that, it says that they, were, they were in one place and God tells him directly, he says, go down and he even tells him which road to go on. Get on this road from Jerusalem down to Gaza. And then after the, after the appointment was over, God made it even easier and just said, you know what, I'm going to move you to your next appointment. And he snatched him. It says that the spirit snatched him away and the eunuch saw him no more. Wouldn't that have been nice, right? <laughs> Can you imagine if, if when youth camp was over, if God just said, okay, I'll just, I'll handle the travel for you. It took us six and a half hours to drive home from Colorado Springs after youth camp. It would have been very nice. Uh, now, I, I didn't have it as bad. I had the air-conditioned truck. Everybody else was in the non-AC uh, bus <laughs> at 92 degrees or whatever it was. But, you know, wouldn't that be nice if God just said, okay, here, I'll, I'll just move you to your next appointment. But that's what he did. He, he snatched Philip away. So what is a divine appointment? Well, I believe it was God doing something intentionally that we don't know the full story of, right? We don't know what happens, but there was a reason why God wanted this Ethiopian to come to faith. There was a reason that God, God, now I don't know what that reason is, but I do know there is a, there's, there's a powerful legacy. Guys, I, I, I fully believe that there are hundreds, thousands at this point, maybe even millions of Christians that came to Christ because this eunuch took the gospel home with him. There's a reason why God said, Philip, you go and share with this guy in particular. Can one man have that kind of impact on history? Sure. I, I, have you, I, I don't remember the names, but I remember the story. There, there was a story of a guy who got saved in, in Sunday school way back when he was the guy that did the revival service that Billy Graham got saved at. And then Billy Graham, had, we all know what Billy Graham did right? Think about the legacy of that. The guy that got saved in Sunday school. Maybe you think you could even go even one step back. How about the, the teacher that taught the guy? That, you know, at, one, at one point, if, if any of those people along that line didn't come to faith, what, what could have been missed? I don't know the end of this story. I don't know how the eunuch, how he affected his family, his, his, his people, but I do know that God needed him on his team and he used Philip to do it. He said, Philip, I want you to go and share with this eunuch. I want you to go share with this guy. And, then when, he, and when he was done sharing, he snatched him back up and said, okay, we're gonna go to the next thing. So that's the story. What do we see here in this story? Huh? I'm gonna go through this rather quickly because we, we all just read it, but there's a few things I want us to notice. Number one, we, we, we see that, that Philip abandons a, a successful work, Right? We see that they were in Samaria. Pastor Albert talked about last week how they were, how they were preaching there and they, and they confronted the magician, Simon, and, and, but there were people that were getting saved. There was, there was, there was response. There were, there were hundreds of people. So this was a very successful work and yet God said, Philip, I want you to leave that and I want you to go do something else. He goes, he says, I want you to go to a desert place, a desert road. The road to Gaza was not a well-traveled road. It was, it, it, there wasn't going to be a whole lot of people there, right? He says, he, he says, I want you to go and talk to this person. He even tells them, he says, the Holy Spirit says, go and join this chariot. Go up and join this chariot. This, the Holy Spirit says, go initiate a conversation with this guy. And what does he do? He says, do you understand what you're, what you're reading? He point, then he points, he says, from that scripture on, he explained to him Jesus. And then he says, well, is there any reason why I can't be baptized? He said, no, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's change your eternity right here, right now. And then when, it was, when he was done, he moved on to the next appointment. 
right? That's, that's the story. That's, that's what we see here. But what, what's the implication of this story? What are the things that we can learn from this? Number one, we can learn this. The implication, number one, is that God has called all of us to witness. This is Philip, the second named deacon, right? You guys remember we talked about how the congregation selected seven and we had the first one named was Stephen, who was full of the Holy Spirit. We talked about what happened to him. The second one that was named was Philip. This is Philip, another, another deacon, another servant of the church. He wasn't one of the apostles. He wasn't one of the, one of the pastors, one of the leaders. He was a servant that God was using. This was, this, I want you to understand, this could be any one of us. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have gone to Bible college. You don't even have to be a a teacher or or a leader in the church. This could be any one of us God is choosing to use. God has divine appointments set for you as well. So first implication, God has called all of us to witness. Second implication, it may not always be what we want. (laughs) Philip was probably pretty comfortable where he was, right? Hey, you know, even Peter and John had come up. They were in Samaria. He was part of a very successful ministry. They were getting results. They were seeing people get saved. He was probably in a very comfortable place, a very fulfilling place. I'm doing the Lord's work. I'm seeing things happen. And yet God says, oh, by the way, I need you to go to this desert road. Wait, what? But why? I'm comfortable here. This is good. I'm part of a good thing here. See, sometimes, sometimes we, th- we mistakenly think that in, o- that in order for us to move on, that we'll have to have something happen to where we have closure. You guys ever heard of that? <laughs> we mistakenly think, oh, well, I'm going to have to have some dissatisfaction where I am in order to go where I need to go. And guys, that, that may be true sometimes. God may use that. I have seen God close doors and create some dissatisfaction so that you will move on. My best friend tells the story. He, he worked for Nike for 20-something years. He, uh, the, the Nike headquarters is in Beaverton. That was one town over from where we lived up in, up in Oregon. And my best friend, he worked there for, for 20-something years, and he probably never would have left that job because he's the kind of guy that, that uh, he told me one time, he said, I'll always have an iPhone. And I said, why? He said, because they're just cooler. He, he just, he's one of those guys that just thinks there's the cool factor to it. Well, working at Nike, there was a cool factor to it. He liked the fact that he would be at work at Nike headquarters and he'd see Michael Jordan walk by every once in a while. He liked the fact that he recognized people and, and that kind of thing. He probably never would have left that job until they fired him. They fired him for something he didn't do. He got He got blamed for something that somebody else had done. It was an unjust firing, and at first he was distraught about it. He had never been fired before, and you know he said he said I I don't I don't know what happened, uh, you know. But he'll tell you now that was six years ago, seven years ago. He'll tell you now that the job he's had ever since has been the best thing ever for his family. And he said, and I know God was calling me away from Nike, and I ignored it and ignored it and ignored it and ignored it. And it wasn't until God finally allowed me to get fired that he finally that I was finally open to what God had for me. Guys, you don't have to get to that point. See, God can use extreme circumstances to push you into something else. But if you'll be responsive to him before it gets to that point, he may, he may have something for you without having you have having to go through all that heartache. Right? So here he 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 had to he had to leave this. And, and it may not always be what we think we want, right? But we need to understand that God has a plan. God has a plan. I, again, I don't, I don't know the result of what happened for this Ethiopian eunuch that, that got saved. I don't know what happened when he took the gospel home with him. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to finding that out when we get to heaven. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the, the impact of whatever the result of this was. But I, I can guarantee you God did it on purpose. God has a plan. God had a plan for him and his life and what he wanted to do in the Ethiopian people through this, this person that was, that was saved and was, was on the road and, and God brought, brought him Philip. 
God has a plan. We need to understand that for our lives as well because God is going to include us in his plan. That's one of those great mysteries, right? Do you, have you ever thought about why, why does God need us? Have you, ever, have you ever worked with somebody who's new at a job? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been the guy that has to train the new guy? It's, it was, it's so much easier if you just did it yourself most of the times. You know what I'm talking about? You got, you got somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, and you're like, okay, I can spend 10 minutes doing the job myself, or I can spend the next hour and a half teaching you how to do the job. And, and there's, there's sometimes, there's been some times in my life where it's just like, oh, this would just be so much easier if I, if I could just do this, right? If you, if just get out of the way, right? Have you, ever, have you ever tried to help somebody with their computer problems? <laughs> The whole time I'm helping someone, because my, sometimes my wife will be like, can you help me do this? And I'll be like, uh, yeah, um, can you just move? And she's like, no, I don't want you to do it for me. I want you to show me how to do it. I was like, oh, that's so much harder, <laughs> right? Can, can, I, can I just drive and we'll be done? And you, No, you're going to teach me. Oh, okay, <laughs> right? Don't you think God feels that way with us? I, I want this, here's my plan. I want this to happen, but I'm gonna use you do, you people to do it. And by you people, I mean, yes, us. Dunce caps and, 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 uh, and problem children and you know, all of us and all of our imperfections and, and all of our selfishness, all of our sin and everything. But God still chooses to in, include us. God still chooses to use us. Could God have converted this Ethiopian by himself? Sure. It, it, it could have been something very similar to what he did for Saul, right? When, you know, on the road to Damascus, he blinded him. He had, a, he had heard a voice from heaven. It was Jesus himself saying, why are you persecuting me? Knock it off. And here, I'm gonna blind you for three days and then I'm gonna send somebody. God could have taken care of it himself, but he chose not to. He chose to use Philip. He said, Philip, I want you to go down. I want you to share. I want you to approach the chariot. I want you to share the story of Jesus Christ. Guys, God can do a better job than we can, but God chooses to include us in his plan if we are willing. We have to be willing. We have to be willing. So what are the implications? That God has a plan and he wants to include us. What is the lesson we can learn from this story? I want us to learn a lesson about sharing the gospel. There are, there are many different ways to share the gospel, are there not? You know, and I'm not, I'm not just talking about the different ways that you can, I'm not talking about the gospel presentations. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, who, who knows a gospel presentation? Shout out a name. Roman Road, right? A series of, of verses found in Romans that, that you can use to bring someone to, to the gospel. What's another one? What's that? Three stories, okay? Three stories. You, know, you tell your story, you tell them Jesus' story, and you listen to their story, right? That's a very relational kind. What did you say? The napkin, the one verse evangelism, right? We're going to take one verse. We're going to draw out this little diagram on a cocktail napkin or, a, or not a cocktail one. You shouldn't be in a place where you go. <laughs> Coffee shop napkin. There we go. Coffee shop napkin. <laughs> did you hear Pastor Keith said we should be in the bars and witnessing to people? No, I did not say that, right? We got one verse evangelism. Uh, Pastor, what were you going to say? Faith evangelism, yeah, we're going to spell out the word faith, and, and we're going to use that as a, as a tool. There, there, there's, there's, uh, the, there's the way of the master. There's, uh, there's uh, oh, a CBT, what? Four spiritual laws. I mean, there's all kinds of, of tools that you can use to share the gospel. Which is the best one? The one that you know and use. <laughs> I say, if you'll use it, it's the best one. Because if you, if you won't use it, then, then, I, then who cares, right? Who cares if you have knowledge that you don't use? I'll tell you this. You know what, the, you know what the, one of the best tools for evangelism is? It's just your own testimony. Tell them the story of what Jesus did for you, right? I don't care. It, it's, good, it's good that you have tools. I, I think, I think you, to be an effective evangelist, it's better to have more tools in your toolbox than it is to not, right? I, I think there's... 
every single one of those has their different, their different uh, advantages. Well, for a child, I use ABCs, the admit, believe, and confess. For a, for a person who doesn't believe they have a sin problem, I use the way of the master because it brings them to that, that oh, oh crap moment. Oh, I really do have a problem. Yes, you do, right? You know, for, for, somebody, who, for somebody who's just, I'm just having a, a casual conversation with that one verse evangelism works very well. A, for a relational three stories works very well. The more tools you have in your toolbox, the more effective you can be in, in ministry. Ministry. But guys, I want to tell you this, it doesn't matter if you don't, it doesn't matter how many tools you have in your toolbox if you're not willing to use your tools. You have to be willing to, to go out there and do it. You have to be willing to go out there and be a witness. You have to be willing to share the gospel with someone the way Philip did. So I want to talk about that for a little bit. What are some things I want us to learn from this experience? But before we do that, I want to talk about what not to do. Right? There's some there's some people out there who are who are being witnesses for Christ that are um, some of them are, are doing more harm than good. Right? So I want to tell you. Well, here's some things of what not to do. Number one, don't be the bounty hunter. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a. I'm a Star Wars fan. I've watched the, the Mandalorian and, and that kind of thing. And the bounty hunter is the one who's going out there and forcefully bringing something. I, I can bring you in warm or I can bring you in cold, <laughs> right? You know, it's, oh, the bounty hunter witness is the person who is forcefully sharing the gospel with anyone and everyone, whether they want to be shared with or not. They, they can be very abrasive. They can be very in your face about it. These are the people that, that maybe, you know, tact isn't something that they worry about. They don't worry about whether or not they offend and they, they justify themselves by saying, well, if the gospel is offensive to people, well, then so be it. It's like, well, wait a minute. It may not be the gospel that's so offensive. It may just be you, right? The bounty hunter. What are, there's some pros and cons. Now, the pro is the gospel message is spread right? To, su- to some effect, maybe, maybe somebody, is, somebody is, is affected by that. The con is that many are pushed further away and become even more resistant to the, to the things of Scripture because then they begin to label every Christian as this fanatic, untactful, rude person, right? Sometimes it makes things worse. It makes things worse. Don't be the bounty hunter, right? How about, here's another, here's another don't. Don't be the egghead. <laughs> What's the egghead? The egghead is the one that relies on carefully crafted and fleshed out intellectual arguments. I am going to take every resistance that you have. I'm going to take every argument that you might possess, and I'm going to break it down and show you where you are just so wrong. And I'm going to make you feel little and stupid. And I'm going to, I'm going to completely, oh, that's so funny that that's what you believe. Here, let me, let me, let me share some knowledge with you. I've known people that, that have, a, have an argument and they've got this, they, 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 they love to debate. Here's the problem, folks. I've never seen a single person come to Christ because they lost a debate. I've never seen a single person say, you know what, you're right. Your intellectual argument is something I cannot stand against. And you, even though you belittled me and told me how wrong I was and all this other stuff, I'm now going to come over and join your team. Guys, that doesn't work that way. I've known so many people that they, all they want to do is debate, debate, debate all the time. And they've got all these, you know, it's, it's, it's good to know your stuff. It's good to have apologetic knowledge, but you've got to do it in the right way. You're not going to argue someone into heaven. Don't be the egghead. Third one, and this is the one that probably most of us are guilty of at one point or another. Don't be the secret agent. <laughs> the secret agent, the uh, I'm a Christian, and if, you, and if you discover me and ask me directly about it, I, will, I might share with you at that point, but only if you ask me first. These are people that say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing through my lifestyle. 
I am living a lifestyle that is so uh, that is so following God and that is so blessed by God that it will serve as an inspiration to the people around me. I'm never actually going to tell them about God. I'm going to wait for them to come and ask me, hey, I see that your life is so put together and you're such a good person and all you handle this so perfectly. I want to know what it, ha- what it is that you have that I don't have. And the problem is that just doesn't happen very often, does it? People, people aren't going to come and, and, and search and, and pull the truth out of you. It's one of the most common ones. The problem is, so that there's, a, there's some pros and cons to this. The, the pro is that, uh, that maybe you're, le- you're least likely to offend that way. Right? You're not gonna. You, 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 maybe you've seen the bounty hunter. Maybe you work with a bounty hunter, and all they do is offend everybody. And you know, uh, you know, <laughs> children are fun. <laughs> uh, I, I had, I had a young. <laughs> don't shake your head. No. <laughs> I had, I had a, I had a little, I had a little boy one time. He, he got saved. He was about eight years old. He got saved and he got baptized and he went, the, his parents told me the story. He went to school that Monday morning after being baptized and professed to his entire class that if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, you're going to hell and you're going to burn. <laughs> now, true statement. Yeah. <laughs> Done in the right way? No. <laughs> this parent got some, uh, some angry phone calls from other parents because little kids were coming home crying because they were going to die and burn in hell. <laughs> and so, you know, there, 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 there's, a, there's a problem with that. So maybe, maybe you have somebody at work or something like that. You've known a bounty hunter. So in, in, your, in your desire to not be offensive like that, you've decided to be a secret agent and just let your lifestyle be your witness for you. The problem is people aren't going to know why you're different. They may notice that you're different. But most people aren't going to initiate a spiritual conversation because a spiritual conversation is hard for an unbeliever to have, right? They may have some curiosity, but it's not going not gonna to always happen. And, here, and here's, the, here's the biggest con. The biggest reason I don't like secret agents is because it is a self-centered way of easing our conscience while skirting one of the commandments of God commandment of God was to go and make disciples, not go and live a lifestyle that other people might or might not notice a difference. We are called to share the gospel. So how can we do it in the right way? How can we do it the best way? I want us to look at this as an, as an example, this divine appointment as an example to teach us what to do, what to do. Number one, we need to be sensitive and available. We need to be sensitive and available. Look what it says here in verse uh, verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to to Gaza. Verse 27, and and he argued with him and said, but Lord, I'm being useful here. Is that what verse 27 says? No. What does it say? It says, and he arose and he went. We need to be sensitive, first of all, that God might call us to something different. I've had people ask me, how do I know what the Lord's calling me to do? And I said, well, keep doing the last thing the Lord told you to do until he tells you to do something different, right? That's a good, that's a good rule of thumb, right? Well, here, Philip was, saying, Philip was called up to Samaria, and he was sharing in Samaria. He was continuing to do that until God called him to do something different. And he didn't argue with God. He didn't say, but, but Lord, I'm comfortable here, but Lord, I'm, 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 I'm being effective here. Look, look how many people are being saved. Why would you want to stop that, God? Uh, it's almost as if you think you know better than I do. <laughs> Does God know better than we do? <laughs> Every time, right? So you need to be sensitive, but being sensitive isn't effective if you're not also available. If you're not also a willing to respond to the call of God. See, it doesn't do any, any good that we can hear the call of God if we're not willing to respond to the call of God. When I tell my son, hey, it's time for you, it's your dish day, it's time for you to wash the dishes, and he says, I know, and then he doesn't wash the dishes, <laughs> do you think he's in my, on my good side 
or on my bad side, <laughs> right? You know, we, we, you know we, can, we can be sensitive to the calling of God. God says, listen, I want you to go share with that person over there. Yeah, yeah, that would be good if I went and shared with that person over there. We gotta be available. We gotta be willing to go and do that as well. Second thing I think we can learn from this is we need to be proactive. We need to be proactive. So he was, he finds himself there in verse 28, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet of Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. And when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? In other words, it's, it's one thing to be in the right place at the right time, right? Philip Philip followed the will of God, the call of God, and said, hey, go to this desert road on the way to Gaza. So Philip went, and he, and he, and he went to the place that God told him to go to. And then the, this chariot was going by with this eunuch reading Isaiah, and, and, and the Spirit tells Philip, he said, now go and join this conversation. Go and be proactive. You see, we need to be sensitive and available, but we also have to be proactive enough to initiate the spiritual conversation. Right? At some point, you've got to take the conversation from the things of this world to the things, to the supernatural, the things of God. At some point, you're going to have to make some kind of question or transitional statement to get that conversation pointed in the right direction. Because as long as you're expecting them to ask you, you can just keep on expecting. They're probably not going to come to you. Guys, I've been pastoring for 20 something years. And I've, I've only had maybe three times in my life where somebody has approached me and says, I wonder if you would share with me how I can become, a, uh, how I can accept Jesus as my savior. Only three times. We're talking the lowest hanging fruit, right? Almost every other time I've had to be the one to transition into a spiritual conversation. Right, Because people want to talk about what's going on in their lives, the problems that they're facing and that kind of thing. And you're the one that needs to be able to point them to the answer, which is God. You're going to have to be proactive in that. Third thing, we should be tactful. Tactful. The truth of the gospel is offensive to some, and and that's and that's okay. You know, I've 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 said this before. I've, I've told I've told Dad this before. I said I said you know what? Um, if I offend people with the truth of the word of God, I'm okay with that, right? If I stand up here and say uh, gossip is bad, so stop it. If you read my newsletter article, I said that basically. Stop it. <laughs> it's evil. You're doing the devil's work. Stop it, right? And if that makes you mad, okay. <laughs> you know, if, if me standing up here saying abortion is murder, if, that, if you don't agree with that politically, I'm okay with you being mad at, because I know you're not mad at me. I know you're mad at the word of God, right? If I, stand up here, if I were to stand up here to say and say homosexuality is sin, that's not my opinion, that's God's opinion. If that offends you, I'm sorry, but not sorry, right? I, I'm okay with offending you with the, if it's the truth of the word of God is the thing that offends you. Now, if I'm standing up here and I'm being offensive in that and I'm not saying those things in love or in, in a way to try to draw you in to the, to the spirit of God, well, then that's on me. You know, I, I, me being offensive in the way that I speak is not permitted. I still want to be tactful. If somebody comes to me and say, well, here's what I believe. I believe that if I'm just a good person, that I'll find myself, my, find a, my way to heaven. I can look at them and say, you think you're a good person? <laughs> oh my gosh, you're a horrible person. Right? I, that may be true. I, I've heard family, my family members have said this. They, they, they've They've said extremely rude things, and they, their defense was, well, it's true. And I'm going, that doesn't matter, right? You know, hey, does this outfit make me look fat? No, your face does. That, no, that's, <laughs> that, that may be true, but that's not something you say, right? You have to be tactful about things. I've learned with my wife. It's like, well, that's not my favorite. Right? I, I, I have to be, we have to be tactful. We have to be willing. Philip comes alongside and, and tells us, he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? 
He says, well, no, how can I, st- how can I understand? It? He's like, well, that's because you're an Ethiopian. You're not a Jew. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, why are you, how do you even have a copy of the scripture? Those things are expensive. And, and he could have been very truthful and rude, but instead he comes alongside and says, hey, let me help explain to you what Jesus is saying here or what this is about. We may, have, we may have to first earn the right to, to ask personal questions. Guys, when you start talking to somebody, talking about their spirituality is talking about their, their ultimate eternal destination. That's a very personal thing, right? You may have to spend some time listening to them. You may have to spend some time witnessing to them. You may have to start a little slowly before you've earned the right to ask that kind of a personal question. Right? And you're going to have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit to, to get to that point, right? Because they may not care what you have to say until they know how much you care, right? So we need to be tactful. Fourth thing we can learn from this is we need to be precise. Verse 35 says, And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Guys, when we're sharing the gospel Don't get bogged down on side debates and issues. Don't get bogged down in social issues. You know what a lost person needs to hear the most? They don't need to hear about what's sin and what's not. They don't need to hear about about the the social constructs of, of, of faith. You know what they need to hear? They need to hear the story of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that's gonna get them saved. That's the thing that's going to change their heart, an encounter with Jesus, not an argument about end times or what's going on in our world today. Be precise in your witness. Share with them the story of Jesus. Share with them how his story makes all the difference. Share with them how it made all the difference in your life. Share with them how he can make all the difference in their life. The story of Jesus is the most important thing. What can we see here? We can see that anybody can be a witness. Everybody should be a witness for Jesus Christ. And that God has some divine appointments set up for us. Now, do I believe he's going to handle all your travel arrangements the way he did for Philip? Probably not. I, I wish, right? Yeah, I, I we went to Kenya to share the gospel on a mission trip. That was, that was a, that we had to drive to Seattle, which was three and a half hours. We had to fly to London, which was nine hours. We had to fly to Nairobi, which was another nine hours. We had to fly to Eldoret, which was another three hours. I wish I could have just been like, <laughs> and gotten there, right? But that's not the way it works. But God is going to set up some divine appointments for you. Be sensitive, be willing, be tactful, be proactive, and be precise. Are you willing to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? I certainly hope so. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're gathered here this morning, as we're looking at this story, as we're looking at this example, Lord, I pray that each one of us would be sensitive and and available. Lord, we have too many secret agent Christians here. We have too many people that have, they they have their own faith, but for fear of offending or for fear of rejection or, 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 or a myriad of other fears that they may have, for some reason they have never shared the gospel. Lord, the statistics show, say that there are it is way too few of evangelical Christians who are in churches today have ever shared their faith, have ever led anyone to Christ. Lord, the numbers are disheartening. They're sad. Because so many of us are afraid we're going to do it wrong or we're afraid that it's going to, it's going to go the wrong way or whatever. And Lord, so we, we've, we've never been willing and available to do so. Lord, I pray that that would change in our hearts here today. Lord, I pray that you would break our heart for the lost people around us. Lord, that we would be willing to to answer that call. Lord, to to, to go and and to be a part of those divine appointments you have set up for us, to be used by you in your plan. Lord, we don't know the end result, what it could mean. Lord, we might be the person that shares with that person that, that then shares with millions. 
Lord, we don't, we don't know your plan. We don't, we don't need to see the end of it, Lord. We just need to see what's right in front of us. Help us to be willing and available. Help us to follow through just as Philip did. Lord, I pray for those people that you've surrounded us with. Lord, I pray for the lost in our community. I pray for the lost in our circle of influence. Lord, for our coworkers, our family members, our neighbors, our friends. Lord, you've placed them in our lives. You've placed us. We have the fire of eternal flame burning within us. Lord, that I pray for those around us that, that you might be working on their hearts right now. You might be softening their hearts. You might be tearing down walls they've built up. And Lord, you might, want, you might use us to share that flame of eternity with them as well. Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to follow through. It's in your holy name I pray. Amen. I'd ask you to stand with us. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If God has spoken to your heart. If God has called you to himself, I invite you to come. Pastor Albert and myself will be down front. You come as we sing.
going to continue this morning with our offering. We please have our ushers come forward. It says, Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. I caught a little bit of the end of Pastor Keith's sermon, and it sounds like he was calling us out to live how we're supposed to live and to be the light that we're supposed to be. Guys, there are people out there that depend on it. I depended on it. Somebody was living out their life and their walk in Christ, and that's what that's what helped me find Jesus. So it starts right here. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us Seek your kingdom first We hunger and we thirst Refuse to waste our lives For your our joy and prize To see the captive hearts released 
the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace. We lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. So build your kingdom here. Let the this morning. May you have a blessed week. You are dismissed. Streets.